Hi, and thank you for watching another installment of God's Roadmap to the End. I apologize for not uploading more frequently, but I have not been able to leave the commitments I had at my work to focus full-time on this. However, I have taken five weeks of leave spanning from August 21st, the day of the eclipse over the US, until September 23rd, during which I will be able to devote all of my time to this work and hopefully reach out to those who are lost with the message of good news before we meet our Lord in the air on the 23rd. I also plan to capture the collision between the Red Dragon and Jupiter on September 9th and the days following on a telescope and will also do my best to post this on YouTube and Facebook, God willing, depending on the internet connection I have at the location where I'm going to be. I've had many people ask me to do a video with which I can address the timeline before us according to my understanding of what the Word of God shows us. I have touched on this in some of the previous videos but I still need to cover some of the aspects that will occur during the second half and during the millennial reign of Christ. Now, as I have said in my previous videos, I am not perfect and my understanding could be wrong and as everybody else I am also looking through a glass darkly and we need to recognize that knowledge and understanding improve as time passes and hindsight fills in a lot of detail that we may have missed initially. Our Heavenly Father also reveals more to us through His Holy Spirit as we approach this extremely important time in history and since we are fallible we should expect to make mistakes as not one of us has a hundred percent perfect understanding. And we may be missing one passage in the word that we should have taken into account when reaching a conclusion. In the end, this video should really only be for interest's sake, especially for those who are expecting the return of our Lord on the next feast day that he clearly marked with a wonder in the heavens. As such, I offer you what I understand, doing my best to stay as close to the word of God and avoiding contradictions between passages when deriving and understanding that would satisfy every passage I can find that is providing information about the subject. Also, I simply cannot list all the associated passages that explain this timeline as there is simply not enough time to list them all, but I hope to list enough to show support for the chronology. My understanding of this timeline has progressed and improved over the past year as I realized that I missed very specific passages in the Word that I had to incorporate into the understanding of the events that are prophesied and how these have to be positioned in order to obtain an understanding that does not contradict the Word of God. One such an example is correctly positioning the period known as the beginning of sorrows which I incorrectly considered in 2016 to possibly represent the entire pregnancy period of Jupiter in Virgo. At that point in time, the Lord had not yet given me all the understanding that is associated with the two heavenly signals that mark the sealed up prophecy and vision as given to Daniel by Gabriel. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. So let us look at what happened up to now, and having received more understanding from the Word of God, what could possibly happen in the weeks leading up to September 23rd, and continuing until the end of the millennium. We have to keep Amos 7 verse 3 in mind and remember that our Heavenly Father who loves us very much and who does not want any person to perish reveals to us information about the future before the events occur. Surely the Lord God will do nothing but he revealeth his secret unto his servants the prophets. Starting at the blood moon tetrad of 2014 and 2015 in which we had both lunar and solar eclipses falling on the Lord's feast days, I believe this sign was the key given to us by God in order to understand how he marks his feast days, and that the heavens play a role in revealing the sealed up information to us. This is confirmed for us in the following passages. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel. 
for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. There are three important keys that we have to consider in this passage where Gabriel tells Daniel that specific words would be sealed up until the time of the end and that only the wise would understand. We need to search the rest of the scriptures to provide us with more information to understand what Gabriel intended to convey to Daniel. In chapter 9 of Daniel, Gabriel provides information to Daniel that identifies where the sealed up information could be found, as we see in the following passage. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. According to Gabriel, this hidden information is contained within a prophecy and a vision that we can find in the Word of God. When it comes to hidden information and how to understand this concept better, especially when God hides information for us in His Word, we read the following. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Psalm 19 links the glory of God and what He had concealed to the heavens, as we can see in the following section. Psalm 19 To the chief musician, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. This passage also highlights for us the fact that there is knowledge contained in the heavens that provide words of knowledge that go to the end of the earth. The words that are linked to the end of the earth tie directly back to what Gabriel told Daniel, and we now know that it has to do with God marking his appointed times, as this is what Daniel's initial question was about. What shall be the end of these things? The word also tells us that our Heavenly Father created the sun, moon and stars to act as markers, pointing out his appointed times or Moedim. And this is clearly understood when we look at the fulfillment of the spring feasts where he used a three-hour eclipse of the sun to mark the fulfillment of Passover. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. I believe these passages clearly point out to us that our Heavenly Father had hidden information about the end times for us in the heavens, and that we have to look at what the Word describes to us and match it to what we see in the heavens in order to discover the timing involved with the fulfillment of the sealed up vision and prophecy. As there is a lot of information to cover in this video and we only have a few weeks left until our expected appointment with the Lord in the air, I'm not going to go into too much detail at each point, but will reference some passages that you can study in more detail in order to obtain more insight into the events that I believe will transpire. Starting at the Blood Moon Tetrad of 2014 and 2015, I believe this represents the beginning of what the Word of God refers to as the time of the end. Only through the understanding that we received from the heavenly sign when it was discovered did we receive knowledge of how to interpret specific information in the Word of God and received understanding of how God marks His appointed times with heavenly signals. This information was not given to any generation before us. Although nothing significant occurred on any of these feast dates, the Tetrad was the only one in the past two millennia during which there were both lunar and solar eclipses that fell on the Lord's feast days. I believe this event was a fulfillment of Joel 2.31, in which the Lord tells us that He would provide a heavenly sign before His return. 
and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. This does not exclude the possibility that there may be more severe signs or repeat instances occurring in the days leading up to the Lord standing on the Mount of Olives when it splits in two. But it certainly provides a fulfillment of this passage from Joel when it comes to heavenly signs associated with the moon and the sun being darkened on the Lord's feast day, serving as a warning signal. This sign was also given exactly three and a half years before Rosh Hashanah in September 2017, and the subsequent years until the end of the tribulation are also divided into two three and a half year instances, as we know from scripture. When the blood moon tetrad was given, it was also the first time during which we could discover that the Revelation 12 sign does not represent events that occur in the middle of the tribulation, as the time between the blood moon tetrad and the fulfillment of the Revelation 12 sign on September 23, 2017, was now less than the 1260 days which would be required for this sign to be positioned at the midpoint of the tribulation. Instead, we see how Revelation 12 gives us pieces of the puzzle right from the start of the tribulation all the way to the final three and a half years of the millennial reign of Christ. It is also important to know that the tribulation is initiated with the removal of the restrainer, which the Word of God identifies as the church which received his authority over Satan on earth and that this is the reason why the Antichrist can only be revealed to the world once the church is no longer enforcing God's authority over Satan's kingdom. The revelation of the identity of the Antichrist I believe is associated with the opening of the first seal judgment as described in Revelation 6 and referenced in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Moving on to the conception of Jupiter in Virgo, in November of 2016 there were two notable events that occurred involving Israel, who is in my opinion represented by the women in the heavens. On November 21st, arsons set fire to vast areas of Israel, leading to the evacuation of more than 80,000 people. The United Nations on December 23rd nine months before the fulfillment of the Revelation 12 sign, voted against Israel's settlement building in their own land for the first time in history, with the Obama administration abstaining from the vote and allowing the resolution to pass. These events, even though very notable to those who study prophecy and end times events, would seem to have been forgotten for now. However, remember that these were conception events and I am of the opinion that these will grow into something much larger that will soon become evident when the birth bangs start. This period of birth bangs is also known as the beginning of sorrows. When it comes to the beginning of sorrows as mentioned in the Gospels, there was one passage that I failed to take into account last year, which is very important when the goal is to avoid contradictions with the Word of God. It is also very important to understand what the two alignments in the heaven associated with the sealed up vision and prophecy are showing us, and this is discussed in detail in the following three videos that touched on this subject. Essentially, these two heavenly alignments involving the woman in labor with Jupiter occurs through God's meticulous design of the universe only twice in all of Earth's history. They are 6,017 prophetic years apart, but both of these alignments provide information to understand the events that will occur in September of 2017, with the 3,915 BC alignment showing us the end from the beginning, as written in Isaiah 46 verse 9 and 10. Many of the aspects related to these alignments have only come to light in the past few weeks. These two alignments are in my opinion time markers that are associated with the sealed up prophecy and vision that are respectively marked. This is also confirmed by the three wandering stars that are added to the constellation Leo to form the crown of 12 stars. 
The moon's position indicates the exact hour of fulfillment of events that are associated with Jupiter's position relative to Virgo, and shows us the very precise timing on God's timepiece above us in the heavens of events that have been sealed up in the Word of God and in the heavens for us to discover who is the generation of the end. Initially when I considered the alignments, I was concerned about the differences between these two alignments, but then our Heavenly Father revealed why there are differences and that each of those alignments speak words to us about events that will soon occur. The differences are specifically associated with the position of Jupiter relative to Virgo when the fulfillment marker in the form of the moon moving below the feet of the woman is given and the three wandering stars or planets that are added to the constellation Leo to form the crown of 12 stars confirm the association of the alignment with the events described in the associated prophecy and vision. Once our Heavenly Father allowed me to understand what the differences pointed out to us, I could understand how Isaiah 66 verse 7 fits into this picture. Before she traveled, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. The first image shows us the birth of the child from the woman, whom I believe represents Israel, that is then also referenced in Revelation 12. The prophecy and the vision tells us what will happen and the alignments in the heaven tell us when these events will occur. And she being with child cried, traveling and birth and pained to be delivered. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. The devouring intention of the dragon, which is standing before the woman to devour her child as soon as it is born, is clarified for us in Genesis 3 verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. When we understand the heavenly message, and that it also involves a celestial fulfillment, it is clear that this passage describes the collision of two celestial entities, one of which will be Jupiter, as soon as Jupiter is birthed from the Virgo constellation. Based on what Isaiah 66 verse 7 tells us, the period stretching from the birth of Jupiter from Virgo to the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets is then the time of travail or the beginning of sorrows. I did not yet have this understanding when I made the third video and it would then point us to the events mentioned in Luke and Matthew all concentrated into this two week period before the departure of the church from the earth. The second alignment in the heavens that is associated with Revelation 12 shows us the fulfillment of the next feast day on God's calendar. It is the Feast of Trumpets and it is marked accurately down to the hour during which the feast would be fulfilled from Israel's perspective. The methodology with which this feast day is marked with a very unusual heavenly sign matches the pattern provided to us during Jesus' crucifixion and validates Genesis 1 verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven, to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years. It also confirms for us that Revelation 12 is the vision that was sealed up by God and kept hidden from generations before us, as this sign is fulfilled exactly during the time on God's calendar when one day changes into the next and we are the only generation to have received this knowledge. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. I believe what we are seeing when we look at the two positions of Jupiter in these two alignments is the fulfillment of Isaiah 66 verse 7, in which we see the birth of the child introducing the beginning of sorrows to Israel. On September 9th, according to the position that our Heavenly Father has shown us in the alignment that shows us the end from the beginning, 
We see that Jupiter's heel is bruised by the seed of the serpent as soon as Jupiter is birthed from Virgo, fulfilling the following scriptures on this day and in the two weeks that will follow. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Forasmuch as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it brake in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in divers places. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. For these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. All these are the beginning of sorrows. The sign that is scheduled to occur on September 9th will be a confirmation for those who believe not only that God's word contains the absolute truth, but also that it clearly describes the date of the departure of those who have been born again in the Spirit and who are eagerly awaiting the return of their Saviour and Bridegroom. This feast day will be fulfilled with the same accuracy as the collision between Jupiter and the seed of the serpent. This event will then lead into a two-week period during which the aspects that Jesus mentioned in the Gospels associated with the beginning of sorrows will occur. Luke specifically mentions the fearful signs in the heavens which are not mentioned in Matthew. I believe the reason for this to be the fact that Luke addresses the Gentiles and only the Gentiles were given understanding of the heavenly signs, having all of God's word contained in both the Old and New Testaments. Both of these are required in order to complete the puzzle. I believe the perplexity that is mentioned in Luke 21 verse 25 has to do with the fact that people will firstly be perplexed at realizing that Jupiter is not a gas giant, as shown to us when we apply Boyle's gas law to our consideration of how gas would behave in a vacuum. Secondly, they will be perplexed at how it is possible considering the vastness of space for two planets to collide, and why no mainstream information source shared this crucial information with the world before it occurred. Just before September 23rd, on the 21st, which is the United Nations International Day of Peace, the theme for this year is peace and safety, and the word clearly shows us the fulfillment of the following passage. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, 
as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. On September 23rd, the world as we know it will change forever when millions of people will suddenly vanish from the planet. This date is marked by the second alignment and the marked time for the fulfillment of this vision, as described to us in Revelation 12, will occur during Israel's twilight on the evening of September 23rd. Based on what the word shows us, the earliest fulfillment of the Revelation 12 sign and the hour that follows occur between 1845 and 1945 Jerusalem local time. We know that the Revelation 12 sign is clearly marking the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets, as we read in the following passage. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. The fulfillment of this feast marks, in my opinion, the second part of the first resurrection, where God will harvest his main portion of his barley harvest, or those that belong to the holy place of his temple. These include all those who have died in Christ after his death on the cross, and those who will be alive and who are watching and expecting the return of their bridegroom. John describes the 24 Old Testament saints who formed, together with Jesus, the first fruits of this harvest, and who are known as the elders sitting on thrones in the most holy place of God's temple. They were resurrected with Jesus and ascended with him to be presented before the Father with Jesus, who was the first of the first fruits. I believe we also see a reference to this harvest action given to us in the book of Revelation, where Jesus is seen on a cloud thrusting in his sickle to reap the main harvest. And I looked and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Paul provides more information from an earthly perspective. The first is found in 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. More information is given to us in the following passage. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. This event also coincides with the open door seen in heaven, in my opinion, and matches the events that are described in the following passages. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. 
Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. This is also linked to what we read in two parables that Jesus gave us that are associated with the heavenly wedding. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Something interesting that I saw in a video recently was the possible delay that could occur between the resurrection of the dead and the ascension that will follow as part of the rapture. When Jesus and the Old Testament saints were raised from the dead, Jesus and these saints appeared unto people before they ascended to heaven. Jesus told Mary not to touch him in the morning as he had not yet ascended and later that same day he invited his disciples to handle him, showing us that the ascension had already occurred. Could the same be true just before the rapture occurs? Could the shout at midnight represent the resurrection of the dead and the change from mortal bodies into glorified bodies? If there is a pause between this event and the ascension of those who were changed, the foolish virgins will find themselves remaining in mortal bodies and would be desperate to obtain the immortal bodies that they would see the wise were given, who were watching and found ready at the time when the bridegroom's arrival is announced. This would give a very accurate understanding or interpretation of the extra oil that they would desire but would need to obtain from those who sell it during the tribulation. This is then where I believe the wise and foolish virgins are separated and where the main harvest is separated from the corners of the field. This is also where the holy place is separated from the outer courts of the temple where those who are supposed to have been the salt of the earth have lost their savour and will be trampled underfoot for forty-two months. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out, and to be trodden under foot of man. I am of the opinion that those people who find themselves in this period of time can be compared to Lot's wife, who turned into a pillar of salt when Lot was rescued, having a greater desire for the world that they were supposed to be leaving behind, than looking forward to being with their bridegroom. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Those who arrive in heaven, having garments of righteousness, will see one person there without a garment at their arrival, as we read in Matthew 22. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Who is this person that did not have a wedding garment, and that was bound hand and foot and cast into outer darkness? I believe Revelation 12 gives us the identity of this person. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation, and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. From the time of Job, considered one of the earliest books written in the Bible, we know that Satan had access to heaven, and that he accuses the brethren before our Heavenly Father day and night. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Revelation 12 also tells us that when the wedding guests arrive in heaven, that the one without the wedding garment who is clearly identified for us as Satan will be bound and cast out into the earth and will after this point no longer have access to heaven. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. At this point we return to what Paul has written, telling us about the events that will follow once the restrainer had been removed, which is the spiritual church being the only entity to have received God's authority over Satan's kingdom in the world. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Paul describes to us twice in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that an event will precede the revealing of the Antichrist. The first I would like to look at is given in verse 6 to 8. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. This passage describes an event, namely the removal of the restrainer that is required for the Antichrist to be revealed. The same order of events is described to us in verse 3, but often misinterpreted when considering the meaning of apostasy in this context, which is once again related to the removal of the restrainer that precedes the revelation of the Antichrist. When it comes to the Antichrist's revelation, we find the method with which he will be revealed in Daniel 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These passages show us how the tribulation will start. 
As soon as the church is raptured, a new kingdom will be established and will be different to all the kingdoms that existed before it. This is also explained to us in the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in which the statue was described. These ten kings represent the ten toes of the statue which was a mixture of iron and clay, pointing us to the fact that these ten rulers will have mixed DNA, otherwise known as Nephilim. They will appear on the scene as soon as the church is removed and will offer the world an explanation for the disappearance of millions of people from the earth. This is part of the great deception or the strong delusion that we read about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not in the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The strong delusion will most likely involve a statement by these ten kings saying that they were responsible for the removal of those people who disappeared and that this was a necessary act to assist humanity to achieve the next level in their evolutionary path required for humanity. The truth, however, is that these ten kings were restrained by the church that had to be removed in order for them to assume authority over the world. The world will be in chaos given this new unexpected dispensation that those who remain behind on earth will find themselves in, and many will realize their mistake in not believing those who shared with them the loving invitation by our Lord to join him in his marriage. This invitation was available freely to any person who would accept and who would watch for the return of their Savior to meet them in the air and to escape the things that will be coming upon the earth. From September 23rd until October 15th the world will transition into this new dispensation and October 15th is a very important day that we will look at next. During this period of about three weeks the ten kings that represent the ten toes of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar will take over the government of this world and the following passage will be fulfilled. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Shortly after these ten kings have assumed their position of authority over the earth, three of them will be removed and replaced by an eighth, which is of the seven that remain. There will be some sort of conflict in which three of these kings will be destroyed and where the eighth that will take over their position will be the Antichrist. This conflict that will lead to the revelation of the Antichrist is also where I believe the Antichrist will receive his deadly head wound and where he will be resurrected from the dead showing the world that it is futile to make war with him. I see the following passages to be among those that apply to this period between September 23rd and October 15th. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land, which shall not visit those that be cut off, neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken nor feed that that standeth still. But he shall eat the flesh of the fat, and tear their claws in pieces. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock! The sword shall be upon his arm, and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders.
and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? By October 15th, the Antichrist would have become the supreme ruler over the world, and will on this day have the other seven kings giving their power to him, and will then establish his covenant with the world. I believe that this covenant that is mentioned in Daniel 9 verse 27 is not a peace covenant, even though this is what has been traditionally taught. I see the covenant as the mark of the beast system in which the Gentile nations of this world will be forced to choose between accepting the mark of the beast in their bodies and being transformed into the image of the beast, or if they chose not to accept the mark to face beheading. I will explain why I believe the covenant cannot be one of peace in the next few minutes, but first I want to share the passages that refer to this covenant and will then show you why I believe this will happen on October the 15th. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I see this last passage as proof that it is possible for someone who was saved before the rapture occurred, but who were found to be not ready to meet the bridegroom to lose their salvation, if they would accept the mark of the beast. There is no salvation for a person after accepting the mark, as clearly proclaimed by the angel in Revelation 14. The only way for a person to keep their salvation, should they find themselves on the earth when the Antichrist has come to power, will be not to love their lives unto death. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. What else happens on this day? We read in Nehemiah 9 that on this day Israel is set apart from other nations and become slaves in their own country, as can be seen in some excerpts from Nehemiah 9 that are connected to this day on Israel's calendar. We also understand from Scripture that Israel will not be offered the mark of the beast and will in this way be the only nation alive at the midpoint of the tribulation, still having God's original image in their DNA. Now in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths and earth upon them. 
Nevertheless they were disobedient, and rebelled against thee, and cast thy law behind their backs, and slew thy prophets which testified against them, to turn them to thee, and they wrought great provocations. Therefore thou deliveredst them into the hand of their enemies who vexed them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, and according to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them saviors, who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. For they have not served thee in their kingdom, and in thy great goodness that thou gavest them, and in the large and fat land which thou gavest before them, neither turned they from their wicked works. Behold, we are servants this day, and for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof, and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. And it yieldeth much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant, and write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. Did you notice the mention of the sure covenant in the final passage? This covenant is also mentioned in Isaiah 28, and called Israel's covenant with death. Because ye have said, We have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement? When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion, for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious corner stone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. From the time that it goeth forth it shall take you. For morning by morning shall it pass over, by day and by night, and it shall be a vexation only to understand the report. I will also vex the hearts of many people, when I shall bring thy destruction among the nations, into the countries which thou hast not known. Yea, I will make many people amazed at thee, and their kings shall be horribly afraid for thee, when I shall brandish my sword before them, and they shall tremble at every moment, every man for his own life, in the day of thy fall. For thus saith the Lord God, The sword of the king of Babylon shall come upon thee. I think you will agree that the way in which this covenant is described, it is clear that it does not promise anything good for those who enter into it. So why do I believe that this covenant that the Antichrist will establish with many will not be a peace treaty? The word of God clearly shows us that peace on earth is not part of the tribulation, as can be seen from just the following two passages. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. We have already seen that Satan is cast down to the earth as soon as the church is raptured, and he then persecutes the woman who gave birth to the man-child which is Israel. Nowhere does the Bible show us that the Antichrist establishes a peace covenant or peace treaty with Israel. When the first seal is opened, the Antichrist is revealed to the world. And once the mark of the beast is in effect, seal 2 to 5 are also opened and continue until around the midpoint of the tribulation. The second seal clearly explains that peace is removed from the earth and that people will kill each other. 
And as such, I do not believe that we will see a peace treaty between the Antichrist and Israel or the Gentile nations. Only those who accept the mark of the beast and who become part of the Nephilim in the process will have peace during the first three and a half years of tribulation, believing that they have ascended to the next level of existence in the evolution of the human race. This peace will, however, be short-lived and will be nothing compared to the torture and agony that await those who accepted the mark. From this point forward, Israel will be enslaved by the Antichrist, and where one-third of the nation was killed during the Holocaust, the Word of God explains that two-thirds of the nation will perish during Jacob's trouble, up to the point where the remnant receives protection from God in the wilderness once they flee Judea. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, It is my people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. On October 15th, another event takes place that is important to note. This is also the day on which the ministry of the two witnesses will begin, since 42 months or exactly 1260 days later from this point takes us to the day of Passover in 2021. During this period of time, an end is made to the Gentile nations who refuse to exchange the image of God in their DNA for that of the beast. When it comes to the Gentile nations, we understand that this period of time represents that portion of the barley harvest known as the corners of the field, or the gleanings, that are left to the poor and which the owner of the field is not allowed to harvest. Those who are beheaded during this time for refusing the mark of the beast and for having the testimony of Jesus and the word of God will also form the final part of the body of Christ, which is represented by the outer courts of the temple which is said to be trampled underfoot for forty-two months. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. This period of time between October 15, 2017 and March 28, 2021, has several purposes that will be fulfilled before the Lord returns. Firstly, I believe this period represents the first half of the seven-year covenant that is established by the Antichrist, and this covenant is interrupted midway by the Lord's return, as we will soon see. This period also represents, in my opinion, the time known as Jacob's Trouble, in which Israel will be treated after the pattern provided to us during their time in Egypt, before their exodus. For three and a half years, Israel will be slaves in their own country and will also be trafficked to other locations. And the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. The rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of ten to dwell in Jerusalem the holy city, and nine parts to dwell in other cities. More information is given to us about the way in which Israel will be treated during this period in passages from Lamentations. You are welcome to read the book of Lamentations to understand Israel's situation during this time better. This is the time during which the dragon will persecute the woman, who I believe to be Israel. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. During Jacob's trouble, the enemy will sow the tares into the wheat harvest, which is represented by Israel. They ravish the women in Zion, and the maids in the cities of Judah. Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes, their houses shall be spoiled, and their wives ravished. Behold, I will stir up the meads against them, which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. 
These passages describe to us that the women of Israel will be raped, and when they flee into the wilderness, there will be those who are described by Jesus in Matthew 24, carrying the offspring of those who raped them. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. Those who are protected by God in the wilderness will include only people from Israel, and those who are the offspring of those who have the mark of the beast. These are the tares that are mentioned by Jesus that will grow up with the wheat, and will then be burned first before the wheat is gathered into the barn at the end of the millennium. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came, and sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up, and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came, and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. When we shift our focus to the Gentile nations, this period also represents the time during which the fullness of the Gentiles will come in. When John is shown the temple in heaven, he is told not to measure the outer courts, as this is the section of God's temple being put together during this time, and it is not complete at the point when it is shown to John. This 1260 days will, in my opinion, bring to an end the existence of people from Gentile nations having God's original image in their DNA. Those who will be alive on the earth after 1260 days will either have the mark of the beast in their DNA or will be part of the nation of Israel who will be the only mortals alive on earth still having God's image in their DNA. Israel will not be offered the mark of the beast and will be the slaves of those who will rule the world at this point. This period also represents the ministry of the two witnesses that will start on October 15, 2017 and will end on March 28, 2021, which is the day of Passover, 42 months later. Based on some of the patterns that we discussed in the Rapture series, we know that the two witnesses will follow the same pattern set by Jesus in their ministry and that they will most likely be murdered by the Antichrist on Passover three and a half years after the rapture occurred. This will be on the same day that the remnant will flee into the wilderness. By October 15th, the fifth seal will be opened, which means that the four seals preceding it would also have been opened by this time. These include the revelation of the identity of the Antichrist, which will be a hybrid being in my opinion, or a mixture between human DNA and that of the fallen angels, as was the case in the days of Noah. We also see this referenced in Daniel 2 where these ten kings are described. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. The first seal describes to us the Antichrist's revelation and the fact that he will conquer the earth. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. During the 1260 days, the Antichrist will blaspheme the name of God and those who had been raptured and who are dwelling in heaven at this point. 
and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. The second seal describes to us that peace would have been removed from the earth, and that people will kill each other, and many will also be killed by the Antichrist according to his covenant. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. The third seal describes firstly famine in the world, where food will become expensive, but secondly it will also seem to give us an idea of the proportions that will be killed during this period of 1260 days. Of those who will be killed, one out of every four people will be a Jew, and the other three will be Gentiles. The oil represents the two witnesses who will kill those who would try to hurt them during this period. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick, and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. The wine represents the vine of the earth, or those with mixed DNA, having accepted the mark of the beast, who will not be hurt during these 1260 days, but who will be deceived by Satan to exchange their eternal destiny for a three and a half year period of peace on earth, and the ability to buy and sell. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. The fourth seal describes the situation during the 1260 days that will follow October 15, 2017. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. The fifth seal describes those who will refuse to accept the mark of the beast, and these represent the corners of the barley harvest, which is the third part of God's first crop, of which the defining attribute is that they had faith in Jesus as the Son of God. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren, that they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. I believe these five seals will all be positioned as part of the first half of the tribulation, and that these will all be complete at the time when the two witnesses lay down their lives to be killed by the beast. They will willingly submit themselves to death after emptying the oil out of them for those who would not deny Jesus. At the point where they lay down their lives, there will remain nobody on earth with God's image in their DNA who would still be eligible for salvation through faith, 
The only mortals alive on earth at this point will be the remnant of Israel, who will be fleeing into the wilderness when they see the two witnesses beheaded. One other important date to take note of is mentioned in Haggai 2, and this marks the day on which the foundations of the third temple will be laid in Jerusalem. The Antichrist will force those of the nation of Israel to build the third temple in which he will eventually sit to show himself that he is God, just as Israel was enslaved to Pharaoh when they were in Egypt. Consider now from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. This day falls on December the 13th, and is the day before the start of the Feast of Dedication, or Hanukkah. It is possible that those who will be on earth will see the third temple's foundation being laid on this day. There is an interesting conjunction between the comet 10p temple, Mercury and Jupiter, which would basically spell out God's message about the completion of the temple on March 5, 2021. This is most likely the date from which the sacrifices and oblations will resume, as can be read in Ezekiel 40-46, which you can read for yourself describing this temple service to us. Shortly before we reach Passover at the midpoint of the tribulation, I believe the sixth seal will be opened, and the effects of the collision with Jupiter will begin to impact the earth. These are explained to us in the seven trumpet and bowl judgments that are described in Revelation 8, 9 and 16. We have to remember that the book of Revelation does not provide information strictly chronologically, and as such when you compare the trumpet and bowl judgments, you will see that they describe the same events in order, but from a different perspective. The trumpet judgments will describe the heavenly events that will happen, and what effect that will have on the earth, while the bold judgments will describe the same event in order and how they will affect the beast and his kingdom. Some of these asteroid impacts will occur with the earth before Passover in 2021, as we see the word of God showing us that people will die from drinking the water that would have become contaminated by the extraterrestrial objects. They are therefore still mortal and do not have the mark of the beast. Those with the mark of the beast will be given the ability to escape death, which will become a curse, as we will see in the sixth seal. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. On the day of Passover in 2021, or on March 28, 2021, the final Gentile with God's image in his DNA would reject the mark of the beast will be beheaded. This is when the two witnesses will end their ministry and will lay down their lives willingly to be killed by the Antichrist. These events occur after the pattern provided to us in Jesus' ministry. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. This is also the point at which the Antichrist will stop the sacrifices and oblations, and where he will set up the abomination of desolation in the temple. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand, then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. This will be the day on which the fullness of the Gentiles would have come in, and after this point, only those with the mark of the beast and the remnant of Israel will remain on the earth. 
The fullness of the Gentiles also means that Israel's blindness will be removed, and they will be given understanding of that which they have been blinded to since they rejected their Messiah. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become end. I have come to the realization that the seven thunders that are mentioned in Revelation 10 will utter their voices in this time, and that this will play a role in removing Israel's blindness and giving them the evidence they are looking for in order for them to recognize their offense and turning them back to their Messiah. The following passages are referencing Israel's situation at this point in time. I will go and return to my place, till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction they will seek me early. And I will pour upon the house of David, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. This is the point at which the Lord will take Israel back under his wings and will protect them in a time where life on earth will become impossible. Those with the mark of the beast will from this time forward live in a world where death escapes them and torment awaits them, and I will show you why this is the case. When the two witnesses' bodies lie in the street of Jerusalem, the remnant will be in the process of fleeing into the wilderness. Three and a half days later, the two witnesses will be resurrected after the pattern of Jesus' resurrection, and in the same hour the Bible tells us about an earthquake that destroys a part of Jerusalem, the temple, and 7,000 men die as a result. And after three days and a an half the Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. This earthquake, in my opinion, is the same one described in Revelation 12 and in Zechariah 14, and which leads to the Mount of Olives being split in two. The remnant is specifically mentioned in this passage and they are also mentioned in the following passages below where Israel is associated with the woman fleeing into the desert and Israel identified fleeing in a previous earthquake during the rule of King Uzziah. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. This point on the timeline is what I believe the word shows us is the Lord's return to the earth. This happens when the remnant of Israel had been fleeing into the wilderness for three and a half days, and in the same hour that the two witnesses and the tribulation saints are resurrected and ascend into heaven, as the third and final part of the barley harvest, the Lord returns to the earth. If one tries to look for the timing of the Lord's return to the earth, there is no passage that clearly positions the timing of this event for us. 
Traditionally, our understanding of this timing has been based on the chronology in which the Word of God was written. But when we read it strictly with a chronological approach, we end up with some contradictions. For instance, if we believe that the Lord returns at the end of the seven-year tribulation, we then have to explain the two instances in which the remnant will be fleeing from Jerusalem, as seen in Revelation 12 and Zechariah 14. We also have to consider that both passages describe to us the earth being split open in the same location, but a thousand two hundred and sixty days apart if we understand Zechariah 14 to show the Lord's return occurring at the end of the seven years. Revelation 12 tells us that there remains a thousand two hundred and sixty days of the remnant's protection after the earth opens her mouth to swallow the flood, and that those in Judea who would have been heeding the words of their Messiah and who would have fled into the wilderness at this point are saved by this geological event that saves them from a flood. This is clearly a repeat of what happened in the days of Moses where Israel fled into the wilderness on the day of Passover. The problem we have to solve then is how to explain the fact that there would seem to be a dual occurrence of a split in the crust of the earth in the same location and Israel fleeing into the wilderness twice, which becomes a contradiction if we position the Lord's return at the end of the tribulation. Why would Israel need to flee twice if they have already been nourished in the wilderness under God's protection? The only way in which we can solve this contradiction is to understand that Zechariah 14 is a piece of the puzzle that meshes with Revelation 12 and that these two chapters in the Word of God are in fact describing the same events. This is then tied to the pattern that we are given in the book of Daniel, where Daniel's three friends were seen in the furnace that was heated to seven times the normal temperature, and the other events that are associated with this point in time. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days, in the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people, and healeth the stroke of their wound. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion, and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day, and the shining of a flaming fire by night, for upon all the glory shall be a defense. And there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat, and for a place of refuge, and for a covert from storm and from rain. And it shall come to pass in that day, that the remnant of Israel, and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob, shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. At that day shall a man look to his Maker, and his eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day, that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high, and the kings of the earth upon the earth. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory, and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak, 
Behold, it is I. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Where does the heat come from that are described to us in these passages? In my opinion, this occurs as a result of the cataclysmic events that will take place at this point in time, with the earth being split open by a massive asteroid impact that will literally expose the molten insides of the earth and surround the earth in pyroclastic clouds. This will make life for mortal beings on earth impossible. This is the fulfillment, in my opinion, of the fourth and fifth trumpet and bowl judgments, which all form part of the sixth seal. The sixth seal has to do with the events that take place on earth when it is impacted by the tail of stars or the debris that the red dragon will cast to the earth and these will originate at the time when Jupiter collides with the seed of the serpent as soon as Jupiter is birthed from Virgo. It would seem that the asteroid that splits the earth open will be preceded by three smaller asteroid impacts as described in the first three trumpet and bowl judgments that will also have a devastating effect on the Earth in the affected impact zones. These will begin to impact the Earth shortly before the midpoint of the tribulation. The asteroid that splits the Earth and that will have as a result the shortening of days to only 16 hours and the Earth being turned into a furnace will in my opinion hit the Earth on March 31st, 2021, which is the Feast of First Fruits or the day on which Israel's Messiah will return to the Mount of Olives. The following passages are associated. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Thou sawest, till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days, in the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people, and healeth the stroke of their wound. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them, even by the springs of water shall he guide them. 
Does the final passage not clearly show us that Jesus is with the remnant in the furnace that is heated to seven times the normal temperature during the 1260 days in which Israel will be nourished, just as we saw in the pattern of Daniel's three friends in the furnace? I'm of the opinion that when the Lord takes the remnant back under his wing and provides them protection and nourishment in the wilderness, that this period of protection will be the start of Daniel's 70th week. Just as the first half of the tribulation represented Jacob's trouble in which Israel will be afflicted so that they can recognize their offense, the second half of the tribulation will represent the first half of Daniel's final week during which Israel will receive God's protection. There remains another three and a half year period at the end of the millennium during which Israel, or the wheat harvest, will again receive God's protection, while the tares are burned in the gleaning harvest of the grapes. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. The opening of the sixth seal also describes to us what happens to those who will not be under God's protection, but that will have the mark of the beast. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind and the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? There is much information in this passage which ushers in Jesus' everlasting kingdom on earth. It tells us about the earthquake that will be associated with the earth opening her mouth in Revelation 12, which is also the Mount of Olives splitting in two given to us in Zechariah 14. Next it references the trumpet and bowl judgments that form part of this seal being opened, involving asteroid impacts with the earth and the effects that these will have on the celestial bodies in the heavens. These are obviously linked to the fourth trumpet and bowl judgments. We are shown how those with the mark of the beast will try to hide themselves in the earth, believing that they would be able to flee from him that will be sitting on the throne in Zion. At the point where the earth is split open, we enter into the three woes that are mentioned in Revelation. The first of these occur as part of the fifth trumpet and bowl judgments, and these describe the asteroid that splits the earth open, exposing the bottomless pit, or the molten insides of the earth. At this point the Lord will send out an army that he had prepared to torment those with the mark of the beast for five months leaving them in agony without the option to die. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. We are not told much about the army that is mentioned in this passage, but they consist of two regiments of which the first is mentioned in quite a bit of detail in Revelation 9. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. 
And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. The second phase will include an army of 200 million, different to the first army and described in the second woe or sixth trumpet and bowl judgment. Isaiah and Joel also reference this army of creatures that will only appear at this point in time. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation, to destroy the whole land. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another, they shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city, they shall run upon the wall, they shall climb up upon the houses, they shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withhold their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? These passages describe these creatures as mighty men and the Lord's army that He specifically prepared for this time, and that their purpose will be to torment those with the mark of the beast for the first five months of the second half of the tribulation, while those with the mark of the beast will desire death but not find it. After these five months, which are also linked to the time during which the water rose on the earth during Noah's flood, one third of those with the mark of the beast will be killed, while the rest will be gathered to Jerusalem for the battle of Armageddon. At this point is when I believe the winepress of the Lord is trodden. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. 
and another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickles, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. This event represents the main harvest of the field of grapes. Given the fact that it is mentioned that this harvest is fully ripe, the first fruits of this harvest that is represented by those that have mixed DNA, or who are known as the Nephilim, occur during Noah's flood. The corners of this harvest that are left to the poor are the tares that will grow up with the wheat during the millennium, and they will be reaped during the final three and a half years of the millennium, where the tares are gathered and burned before the wheat is gathered into the barn. We see then that the seventh bowl describes great destruction of the earth that is associated with this harvest, and that there is another earthquake that will be even greater than the one that was associated with the return of the Lord. The seventh trumpet judgment, which is associated with the seventh bowl judgment, tells us that this marks the time of the dead, that they should be judged. Who are the dead that is referenced in this passage, and where do we find an explanation for this judgment? Let us look at the specific passage in Revelation 11, where this is mentioned first. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces, and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art, and wast, and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power, and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldst give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name small and great, and shouldst destroy them which destroy the earth. Fortunately, we find more detail provided to us in the book of Revelation regarding the time of the dead. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. It is clear to see from this passage that the dead are those who died without Christ during the first 6,000 years of man's existence on the earth. Also notice that the sea is mentioned in this passage, giving up the dead which is in it, and this confirms in my opinion that this judgment takes place at the end of the tribulation and not at the end of the millennium as we have to understand specific facts before we can look at the situation on earth during the millennium. We have to consider the condition of the earth at the time when the tribulation ends. We know what devastating effects a small earthquake off the coast of Japan had on the world in 2011. Nuclear pollution of specifically the Pacific Ocean has had a devastating effect. Consider the levels of radiation on the earth when all nuclear power stations on the earth have had meltdowns and have been spreading radiation around the earth after at least four asteroid impacts which will be much more devastating than the Japan earthquake of 2011. This is why I believe God will have to shorten the days during the second half of the tribulation in order for some flesh to survive an uninhabitable world. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. How then will people live and survive on an earth in conditions where people needed God's protection and for him to shorten the days in order for them to survive? Many argue that God will restore the earth after the tribulation, 
in order for people to live the long lives that are described in Isaiah 65. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner being an hundred years old shall be accursed. And they shall build houses, and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards, and eat the fruit of them. This passage is obviously describing life during the millennial reign of Christ, and sin and death is still in effect. How do we get from the conditions on earth in the tribulation to an earth where people can live for hundreds of years? Does God restore the earth which at this point will be uninhabitable? There is one passage in Isaiah that provides us with an answer. The earth is utterly broken down, the earth is clean dissolved, the earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. This passage clearly excludes the possibility for God restoring the existing earth at the end of the tribulation. And the only option that remains then is that the creation of the new earth and new heavens occur at the end of the tribulation, or at this point, in order for people to be in a position to live the long lives that are described to us in Isaiah 65. There is no way in which people would survive for a thousand years on an earth that had been broken down and that would be glowing in nuclear radiation when God removes his protection from those whom he had to save through this period. This is where the flesh that would be saved through the tribulation would require a new earth to live on, and I believe this is where God creates it. This new earth will exist forever and will never again be destroyed. The same passage also shows us that the new Jerusalem comes down at the beginning of the millennium and that the world will be ruled by God and those who are part of his body from this city. When we have this understanding, we can go back to the judgment of the dead and consider what happens between the time that the seventh trumpet is blown and the end of the tribulation when the new heavens and the new earth is created. The judgment of the dead would seem to be carried out by those who had part in the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This is what is known as the white throne judgment, where those who have become part of the body of Christ will be made judges over all those who died without being saved in Christ from the time of Adam all the way to the point of the rapture, and judgment will be based on these people's works while they were alive. I believe this process will occupy the days remaining after the winepress was trodden and will then lead into the creation of the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. When the new heavens and earth are created 
at the end of the tribulation, we also see that there will be no sea, which would then confirm that this judgment of the dead occurs before the millennium starts. As this statement would not allow for the sea to offer up the dead in it at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, as it would not have existed during the millennium. We also see that the old earth and the old heavens will flee from the face of him that sits on the white throne, positioning the white throne judgment before the new heavens and new earth are created. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. This timing will also be part of what Gabriel mentioned to Daniel. Although I am not exactly sure of the timing and exactly what will occur during these two points in time, but I believe that a 1335 days after the return of Jesus to the earth, the new earth and new heavens would have been created and the new Jerusalem would have come down. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. We now move into the millennial reign of Christ. Those who will be allowed access into the new Jerusalem will only be those who exist in glorified bodies, and who will be sinless. The word of God states that nothing sinful would be allowed through the gates of this city, and that there will be no temple in it, as God and the Lamb will be the temple and we are the body of Christ in which he will dwell. The final temple that would exist on earth will be the temple that will be rebuilt during Jacob's trouble, and destroyed when the Antichrist sits in it to show himself that he is God. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs, and sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Imagine the jealousy this would cause in the remnant of Israel, who will live for a thousand years, not being able to enter into the city that was meant for them, and having the names of their tribes written on the gates, and knowing that the Gentiles have become part of the body of their Messiah. During the millennial reign, the population of the earth will consist of the pure tribes of Israel, and those who came about as a result of the enemy sowing tares into the wheat harvest during Jacob's trouble. These will be the final portion of the vine of the earth that will be burned up at the end of the millennium. What is interesting to note during the millennium is that the nations will have to keep the Feast of Tabernacles on a yearly basis, 
if they desire rain to fall in their country. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up, and come not, that have no rain. There shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt, and the punishment of all nations, that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. This passage shows, in my opinion, that those who are of mixed seed, or who are the Nephilim, who passed into the millennium after being sowed into the nation of Israel as tares, will be forced to keep the Feast of Tabernacles if they desire to have rain in their country for the following year. This would also indicate that the Feast of Tabernacles, and for that matter the Day of Atonement, would only be fulfilled at the end of the millennium, when the final harvests occur, making a final atonement for sins would only be appropriate when no sin will follow that atonement, and where no further sin would be possible. We see then from the passages mentioned that those who live on the earth outside of Jerusalem will still be having their sinful nature, not to mention that many in the population will be of the seed of the serpent. During the millennium, sin will operate purely as a result of people's sinful nature. Satan will not be able to tempt people like he did in the first 6,000 years, as he will be bound in the bottomless pit for the duration of the millennial reign of Christ. Only at the end, during the final three and a half years, will he be released from his prison to deceive the nations one final time. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Jesus and those that will rule with him will also rule the world with a rod of iron, which would seem to indicate that the world will live according to strict guidelines that will be enforced, keeping the mortals and the Nephilim in line with the rules set forth by the king. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. During these thousand years, people will be sinning, which would mean that the two remaining feasts will only be fulfilled at the end of the millennium, when the second half of Daniel's 70th week completes. This will be when Gabriel's prophecy to Daniel will be fulfilled, and when the second half of Daniel's 70th week will provide Israel with protection from the wrath of God over those who will be burned with fire. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the Most Holy. An end to sins is only made at the end of the millennium, when corruptible flesh will be done away with, and when death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. This of course only happens after Satan had been released for another three and a half years to deceive the nations into a final rebellion against God. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, 
Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven, and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night for ever and ever. I am of the opinion that the Gog and Magog war specifically occurs at the end of the millennium. These will most likely include the Nephilim nations that will exist on the earth at this time, and that will surround Israel and Jerusalem to attack, only to be wiped out by fire. We see more of this conflict described in Ezekiel 38 and 39, which I can highly recommend if you are interested in understanding the events around the final three and a half years of the millennium. One thing that stands out for me is the weapons that are mentioned being used by Gog and Magog. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth, and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire for seven years. So that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any tree of the forests, for they shall burn the weapons with fire and they shall spoil those that spoil them, and rob those that rob them, saith the Lord God. It is quite evident to see that the technology that would have gone into these wooden weapons would attest to the fact that the world would have lived in peace for almost a thousand years, and that there would, be, would have been no war or weapons research during this period of time. This is also why I believe the Gog and Magog war cannot occur during the period of the tribulation. During the final seven years of the millennium, Satan deceives the nations for the first half of this period, most likely the tares who would have grown up with the wheat, and they will then try to attack Israel and Jerusalem. They will be destroyed once again, while Israel will be, be, will be protected during a period that will be the second half of Daniel's 70th week. The Bible tells us that the earth and Israel's seed will forever remain before God from this point forward. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. What happens after the millennium? There are two passages that talk to us about this, even though they do not share any details with us. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. I hope this has given you an idea of how I see the end times revealed to us and playing out before us by applying Isaiah 28 verse 9 to 10. Instead of trying to understand the word of God by reading the passages chronologically. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. And may the Lord give you peace in these last days before his return to meet us in the air and also in the ages to come. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the air on September 23rd when we have an appointment with our Redeemer.
God bless.